This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Ian Bremmer, president of the Eurasia Group, the world's leading global and political risk research and consulting firm, and author of the book Every Nation for Itself, Winners and Losers in a G-Zero World, recently spoke to a group of Pennsylvania business and civic leaders. Behind the Headlines now airs part of his presentation. The concept, the conceit, this thing, uh, first of all, a G-Zero world, second of all, too big to fail. Let me just explain that right to begin with so we don't have to later. What do I mean by that? A G-Zero world is a world without global leadership. It's new. We've not experienced it before. It started in 2008. That was the financial crisis was the proximate cause. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Let's be very clear. The camel is global leadership. The camel is global institutions. The camel is not the United States of America. That is a difference. We talk about where we have been. We have lived in a global order that was described relatively well by Tom Friedman. God bless him. Wrote a book, The World is Flat. Don't know if you like him or don't like him. Don't really care. Three million Americans read that book. Anyone that can get three million Americans to read a book on what happens outside the United States is someone I'm very envious of but also as someone we should express our appreciation for. And the reason he accomplished that is because he identified one fundamental truth, which is that if you're in business, the one thing you could not afford to get wrong over the last half a century was U.S.-led globalization. Not just globalization, U.S.-led globalization. That's, that's the one thing. If you got it right, like Bangalore or Singapore, you did well. You got it wrong, like Detroit or the British Midlands, not so good. But that was the dynamic. Not everyone loved US-led globalization, but you had to at least understand it. The world is flat, got it. My point is that if Tom Friedman wrote that book today, he'd be wrong. It's that simple. Why? Why? The old world order was really conceived, created after World War II. That is the last time we experienced a transformational moment in geopolitics. After World War II, Britain had to hand the baton, and there wasn't much left of Britain to hand the baton with at that point, to the United States. And the United States rebuilt the world order. General MacArthur in Japan. The Marshall Plan in Europe. And we created global institutions like the United Nations, the Bretton Woods Accord on Currency, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. All of those organizations sound global. The World Bank sounds global. The World Series sounds global. <laughs> There's a Canadian team. It's not global. Those organizations were created by the United States with American money, with American values, with American priorities, and with the support of American allies. And that was the world order. That was the world is flat. Tom Friedman goes to Bangalore, gets on a golf course, sees a Pizza Hut advertisement, and says, wow, we're not in Kansas anymore. He actually says that, and the world is flat. And people make fun of him because they say, oh, it's, you know, it's like he gets on an, airport, he t on an airplane, he talks to a taxi driver, he hears something, and he writes a column about it. Well, it's hard to write two columns a week every week for the rest of your life. I get it. But what it was, this globalization was driven by the U.S. So of course it was U.S. brands. Of course it was U.S. products. Globalization brought the rest of the world closer to the U.S. 
and its allies, the advanced industrial economies. That's what it did. Over the course of the last 30 years, we have seen an extraordinary rise of new markets, of emerging markets. Fareed Zakaria, who a lot of you probably see on the weekends, GPS, writes about this as the rise of the rest. I disagree with him. I'll tell you why in a moment. But the point is that that has changed things because now you have a lot of new countries that matter. You have in the world today over 50% of global economic growth coming not from the democracies but from the emerging markets. Not from the rich countries but from the poorer countries. That shift matters. It matters a lot. And there have been shocks to the global system over the last decades, but the one that finally changed that world order was what came in 2008, the financial crisis. And after that, we have not the US-led global order, but this G0. You have an absence of global leadership. Why? Why are we now in the G0? So I'll first explain that, and then I'll explain this. We're in the G0 for four reasons. Number one, too many countries. It is hard to coordinate with large numbers. When you get these summits together, and they have these G20 summits, and there are 20 countries, the world's 20 largest economies, and they all get together, and they all talk to each other. Over the course of three days, they can maybe, in the plenary sessions, have two interventions each. That's it. It is hard. Just, even if they all agreed, it's hard. And they have different electoral cycles. And so someone is always out or can't do anything because they've got an election coming up. So of course they can't move. This isn't unique to the United States. Too many. I mean, if you sit me down with 20 of you and say, we're going to figure out where we're going to go for dinner, and I am not arbitrarily dictatorial, as is occasionally my want, we're probably not going out for dinner. Because how are we figuring that out? Someone has to go and do it. But absent that, if no one is going to do that, and you just have the 20, it's not happening. Now, at least if people disagree, if I at least knew that three of you were vegetarians and the rest of us hate going vegetarian, then we're just not having dinner with the three of you. That's okay. We'll see you tomorrow, right? Because we know this. This is like Russia on Syria. Russia's the vegetarian, right? I mean, they're like, no, we're not doing Syria. Okay, we'll do it with the rest of you. But then you have 18, 19 other countries that will talk about modalities, you know? It's like, well, actually, uh, I mean, I've got kids. I, I got I to gotta leave by 10. Well, no, but I want to go to this place across town, but the appetizer allows Let's have a cocktail first. This is what happens. These are modalities, right? Too many countries. It was hard with the G7, the G8, with the G20. You th it's a simple point. It actually is a problem. Too many countries that matter around the table when difficult decisions have to be made. That's number one. Number two, Fareed said the rise of the rest. I say the rise of the different. Not the rise of the worse, but the rise of the different. These countries are different. China, Russia, Turkey, Brazil, they're different. How are they different? They're poor. They don't have anywhere near the per capita income that we do. As a consequence, they're more unstable. As a consequence, their priorities are different. As a consequence, they must be more domestically focused. Their political systems are different. Their economic systems are different. Furthermore, they lack capacity. Give you an example. New Zealand has four million people. India has 1.1 billion. But New Zealand has more diplomats than India does. That's kind of astonishing. Right? When we think about New Zealand, we don't say, well, let's, we need New Zealand to come in and help us out and figure out how to deal with the financial crisis. We don't do that. Well, we need more diplomatic capacity. Let's talk to New Zealand about Syria. We'd like to help. We don't, we don't ask them for that. India, because they're big and their economy is big and is growing and they have all these people and they're in this important geostrategic location, we say, we need India in on climate. We need to talk to them on trade. 
We need to get the Indians engaged on stuff happening in the Middle East, on Iran sanctions. The Indians have less capacity to do that than New Zealand. That's a real problem, right? And it's not just in terms of numbers of diplomats. How long has China had global multinational corporations? 10 years? How many best practices have they developed in that time? How long has Russia had aid-giving organizations or philanthropic organizations? And they just kicked USAID out yesterday, by the way. I mean, the Americans, we don't do this stuff always well. And we've been working at it for decades and decades. The Brits have been working at it for centuries. And we expect that because the emerging markets have gotten big in the last 30 years, that suddenly they have this capacity. They don't. Even if they agreed with us that they wanted to play a constructive role, and frequently they don't, they can't. That's the second reason. The third reason is that our allies have absolutely much less capacity to engage in international leadership today than they did six years ago. I mean, look at Japan, which has a new prime minister roughly every week, right? They've actually had 18 in the last 22 years. That's a record in modern day Asia, record. And they're about to have another one. Note is gone soon. Um, they just had the worst year that that country has experienced since Nagasaki and Hiroshima with the Fukushima nuclear crisis. And that's before you start talking about the anti-Japanese demonstrations spreading all over China in the last week, which probably will have more economic impact long-term on Japan than Fukushima. The Japanese are distracted. You can't ask them to take a serious role in the creation of a new global trade round or climate agreement, not gonna happen. Okay, so Japan's out. How about Europe? Are you kidding me? Over the last 24 months, the Europeans have been completely consumed with the Eurozone crisis, which hits at the very identity of Europe as an institution and as a concept. I am bullish, I am optimistic, I believe that ultimately the Europeans will move towards greater integration, maybe not with Greece, but Greece doesn't matter, it's small. But ultimately we will see stronger fiscal consolidation, we will see banking supervision, but it's gonna take a long time. And until then, every morning Merkel does Europe, afternoon Europe, Bedtime, Europe. In August, she takes three weeks of vacation. That's very civilized, but that's it. But the Europeans can't do this stuff. So that's the, that's the third reason. Our allies are busy. Oh, Canada's not so busy, true. New Zealand has the diplomats, not so busy. These countries are small. Scandinavia, these countries are small. We're not, we're not gonna move anything with their capacity. Fourth reason, maybe the most important reason, we don't want to. We don't want to. Obama, Romney, we don't want to. We left Iraq. Iraq is becoming much more unstable. We're leaving Afghanistan. Afghanistan will fall apart. We're going to lose that war. That's a problem. Syria, 18 months now. 20,000 plus dead, over 200 Syrians, on average every day, getting killed. And it's now complete civil war and it's starting to expand beyond their borders with refugees in Jordan and with fighting moving into Turkey and with an assassination of an opposition leader in Lebanon. This is a fairly serious issue, but I will tell you the truth. If Syria and the Syrian war continues to expand, that is a very big problem for the Syrian people. It is a problem for Turkey and Iraq, and Jordan. It's a problem for the Palestinians. It's not such a big problem for the United States. And we know that. If Afghanistan falls apart, it's a problem for Pakistan. It's a problem for India. It's not such a problem for the United States. It's an issue. It's an issue. We care. We don't want these guys to be nuclear. We care. 
We don't want the human rights violations. But we don't care quite as much as we used to. Because why are we fixing Afghanistan if we're not going to fix New Orleans after Katrina? This is reality. Why are we going to fix Afghanistan if we have 14, 15% real unemployment in this country? It's a real question. Why are we doing it if we're talking about austerity and we have to focus on our deficit? It's a real question. I was, uh, I was talking to some Chinese officials a few months ago, and I asked them about Afghanistan. I said, well, they know that we're going to leave, and they know it's going to fall apart. And, you know, the Brits did Afghanistan way back, and then the Soviets did it, and then the Americans. So I asked the Chinese, isn't it your turn? <laughs> and the Chinese said, we're not touching that. And then not only are they not touching it, they're not going to put troops there. They're not touching it. They're not going to give them money because the Chinese don't want a deal. So if the Chinese, for whom this is a much more proximate danger, are not prepared to play that role, who's going to do it? And the answer is nobody. Hence, we have a G0. I don't like the G0. I don't want there to be a G0. You know what? The world doesn't care what I want. All right? We have so many discussions and debates about policies that we would like to have that are not remotely plausible. All right? that is, I have no interest in discussing any of that with you. I, I want to talk about where we actually are. Now, if any of those, any one of those four reasons I gave you, any one of them would have been sufficient to make you question whether or not the old US-led world order would persist. We have all four at the same time. Going forward, we will not have US-led globalization. We will not have US-led global institutions. What will we have? Well, we may well have lots of US-led institutions that aren't global. We may also have lots of global institutions that aren't run. And we may have other organizations that are less than global. What we will have eventually is a group of coalitions of the willing. Now, we know about coalitions of the willing and when we talk about war. When we go to war, we say, let's get a whole bunch of countries that are like-minded. It won't be everybody. It'll just be a few. But it'll get the job done. We're not going to do it by ourselves. Now, on trade, we are moving from a global model to a sub-global model that is US-led, but will be more efficient in that space. On climate, we are not doing that. On climate, we just have failed meetings. So climate must get worse before we start looking at smaller groups. And until then, the countries that are most impacted by climate will do stuff by themselves. The Maldives, you guys all know the Maldives are going away, right? I mean, there will be no more Maldives. They'll be underwater. And so the government of the Maldives went and bought a bunch of land in India so that they can move their people, right? That's what you do if you're small and the big people refuse to deal, right? And over the course of the next 10, 20 years, either it'll get painful and a small group of countries will start dealing with, mitigate, with adaptation and mitigation, or we'll wait longer and we'll start doing geoengineer. The danger of that is that if you have one group of countries doing geoengineering in one direction and another group doing it in another direction and the water tables are different and where you seed and so you get rain is different and the rest, that can cause wars. That's a problem, right? That's, but that's the kind of things we have to be thinking about, not war. We have to think about what kind of leadership do we get when we don't have global? Because we ain't getting global, right? Let's think about this. There are two big discussions that have been out there recently that I think are irrelevant from a global perspective. Question number one, is the US in decline? So I'm gonna ask you guys. I want a show of hands. You don't get to say I don't know. You have to pick one or the other. Please, please. How many of you, show of hands, believes the US right now is in decline? Show of hands in the world. Okay. How many of you do not think they're? Okay. In decline in Harrisburg is about 65, 70%, this group as representative. Probably not representative because you guys are actually doing comparatively very well. So maybe it's worse. 
Um, but let me say something that I think will improve your moods a little bit. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because whether or not you believe the U.S. is in decline, the U.S. is not going to bail out the Europeans. We're not. We're not writing checks. We're sending Geithner on a plane to dispense advice. We don't give him a checkbook, right? We just don't do it. We just say, nope, don't take, leave the checkbook. In Washington, you can go and you can give them advice. That's worth a lot of money. That's fine, right? We're not going to put troops on the ground in Syria. We are telling the Israelis that we are not prepared to bomb Iran. You guys do it all by yourself. We'd rather you didn't, we'll hold your coat, right? That is true. That is true whether, so in other words, whatever you think about whether or not the U.S. is in decline, this persists. This persists. Second point that I don't think matters very much, and I won't ask you to do a show of hands, is whether or not Romney or Obama wins in a few weeks, the general orientation of American foreign policy on almost every definable issue is going to be about the same. Not domestic economic policy, which matters, but foreign policy. That's important. U.S. policy on China. I mean, you know, look, Romney has a theme. Romney's theme is Obama is anti-patriotic, he's an apologist, he leads from behind, all this sort of stuff. Again, I don't know what you guys think about that. It doesn't really matter to me. I, I try not to do politics, surprisingly. Um, the point is, and you hear him talking about Russia and he beats up on Obama because he's cozying up with Medvedev while Putin's doing bad things and he's beating up on Obama on China and says that he will declare China currency manipulator on day one if he becomes president. And the same thing on Iran and on Israel and on Syria and Libya and the rest. I'll tell you, if Romney becomes president, he will not declare China a currency manipulator on day one. Right? That is just useful politics. Obama said he would close Guantanamo when he was running for office. Last I checked, didn't happen, right? I mean, the constraints on these leaders and what they can and can't do from foreign policy are overwhelmingly large. And, and even when we talk about domestic policy, I'll give you another interesting statistic. In 1974, 3% of retiring congressmen, 3%, became private sector lobbyists upon retiring. In 2011, that number is 51% for the Senate. It's 44% for the House. And you say, well, that's all Democrats, so that's all Republicans. Actually, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same. The numbers don't change. And if, you, if you're gonna become a lobbyist afterwards, you gotta kinda do some spade work while you're in Congress to make sure they're gonna hire you, right? That also means that the level of fundamental change in Congress on the big policy actions is very incremental and will still be incremental unless we have a disaster. That's the point. So on those two big issues that everyone is discussing as if it is a sky is falling issue, Obama versus Romney, decline versus not, I am telling you that actually in the grand scheme of things, these are small issues. I really believe that. I really believe that. Now, I really wanna get to the good news because there is good news. You wouldn't believe it, but there's good news. There's good news around the world, but I wanna start with the good news here because they were asking me what this title, we tried to we brainstorm in the title, right? Brainstorm in the title, what should the title of the talk be? You know, the name of my book is Every Nation for Itself, but that doesn't, that doesn't, it's not very uplifting, right? And we finally came up with Too Big to Fail. You know, Andrew Ross Sorkin, good guy, you guys probably see him on CNBC Squawk Box, he came up with this book, Too Big to Fail, and of course he's talking about the banks. And I remember when I read the book, and it's a great book, it's incredibly well-researched, if you haven't read it, it's dense, it's thick, but it's really good. And I thought to myself, it's not the banks that are too big to fail. No, no, no. The real issue is that it's the United States. Other countries don't have a choice, and they won't. And that's a problem for them, but it's an opportunity for us. It's also a challenge for us, and I'll explain why. But the point is, you guys have heard, you know, when, when, com when countries have a lot of oil, right? They don't need to engage in political and economic reform because they can just take oil out of the ground. As long as they have a lot of oil, it's not a problem, right? 
Well, the United States has better than the capacity to take money out of the ground. The United States has the ability to take money out of other countries' pockets directly, right? It's what it means to have the dollar as the reserve currency. Now you can say, well, that might not last. But in a G0 world, the global volatility of the markets goes up. The global risk environment goes up. The sustainability of the Chinese miracle is more open to question, right? Things become much more dangerous, radically more dangerous globally in a G0 environment than they were when the United States was providing the leadership. And here's where it becomes interesting. That means if you thought the United States was the place people had to go to invest five years ago, you haven't seen anything yet. They have no choice. They want safety. In a more comfortable environment, in a less risky environment, growth is what you go for. You go for growth. Things are safe. You invest in emerging markets. They're all growing. I don't know if you noticed in the last 12 months, emerging markets are slowing down, right? That's a challenge. It's a challenge because those places are less stable. Japan has had zero growth for over 20 years. And yet, there were no meaningful demonstrations in Japan. There are no challenges to the political system in Japan. The resilience in Japan is extraordinary. They don't grow. They're very small. They don't grow. Nobody laughed at that. They don't grow. What's wrong with you people? But, 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 they, but they are incredibly resilient. They are possibly the most resilient advanced industrial economy. You look after Fukushima, they got their supply chain back up and running within six months, 100%. That's extraordinary, right? And so as a consequence, people continue to turn to the yen as a safe currency. The United States is becoming comparatively safer as an environment because everything else looks so bad. Everything else looks so unstable. And that means that our dollar is gonna be strong. That means it's gonna be seen to be comparatively cheap on a risk-adjusted basis. It means that our equities will be able to outperform. Now, there is a downside there, and the downside is that we will not be pressured to deal with the overwhelming long-term issues of deficits. And furthermore, in other words, we'll do just enough to avoid the fiscal cliff, which we will avoid, and then we'll keep on trucking. And it also means that the gap between rich and poor in the United States, which is growing, will probably continue to grow. And that is a misfortune. And that is not the United States that we were taught we wanted to be proud of. But the ability of the United States, the fact that we have a lot of rope to hang ourselves with, we have time to get this right, this isn't urgent. People out there make it seem like we have three years and then we're done. No, 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 no. We actually have a lot more time than that. That's the reality of Too Big to Fail and the G Zero World. Behind the headlines, thanks Derek C. Hathaway, OBE, for hosting Mr. Bremer's presentation.